Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome to lecture six and week four. Uh, today we uh, do an overview of what you learned this week uh, from a thermoelectric system point of view. We started by looking where are the opportunities. If you look at um, the energy flow in US and also in the whole world, the two major areas we are wasting a lot of energy, uh, close to 60% is in electricity power generation and in transportation. This is an area where thermoelectrics could directly convert heat into electricity. We also describe in applications where you have to do very localized coolings like semiconductor lasers or sensors, infrared detectors. Um, then there is a case to use uh, thermoelectric devices even though they have low efficiencies. Um, the efficiencies uh, of, uh, is described using uh, the thermoelectric figure of Merit ZT. And if you look at, for example, in the case of power generation, what are the efficiencies versus the hot side temperature? What is the kernel limit? What we have today? Based on this graph, you would say is a long way before uh, we can reach efficiencies uh, that can compete with mechanical systems. Uh, this graph is misleading for two reasons. First of all, even with the best efficiencies we have, we still throw away more than half of the heat. Uh, so if we can do something useful for the other half that uh, adds uh, to the efficiency. And the second uh, important aspect is what is the cost associated with it. Um, when we look at the cost, we said uh, whenever you have a heat source, if you just add a thermoelectric uh, is not enough to generate power, you need to have a temperature difference, you need to put a heat sink. So really you need to optimize both the thermoelectric and heat sink in terms of the cost together. There is a material use in it and there is some cost associated with heat sink. And uh, we learned quickly that um, an important factor is that the thermoelectric legs should be at a thickness that match the thermal impedance of the heat sources, and often this is quite thick. So we, there is an advantage to do heat concentration inside the thermoelectric, and um, that way reduce the amount of thermoelectric material. Um, so that was one of the key lessons. Um, if we put numbers um, for uh, what will be the cost, material cost to generate a given amount of power watt uh, for a case of automotive application where the heat fluxes are given down here, uh, even with a thermoelectric material of $500 per kilogram, a state-of-the-art um, uh, kind of lead telluride type material, um, today's cost could be on the order of a couple of dollars per watt. By improving ZT, you can reduce the cost, but improving thermal conductivity is more important than improving Seebeck factor. Why? Because that changes the thickness of the material needed to achieve the impedance matching. You need thinner materials and you need less materials. Uh, but um, by reducing the fractional area coverage, by including some heat concentration inside the thermoelectric uh, model, you can bring the cost down at a point where basically the cost of a thermoelectric doesn't come in. That's actually quite similar to the, uh, to the case of concentrated solar um, uh, applications. There they use multi-junction solar cells that are much more expensive, but because you use mirrors and you just need a tiny amount of multi-junction solar cell, um, that's not prohibitive. Here is a case for thermoelectric, you can do that um, for heat concentration, um, and you don't even have to worry about tracking because uh, uh, basically the heat spreading in the thin films of the model take care of the um, uh, sending the heat to the thermoelectric device. Then we looked at um, uh, a key uh, a specific application, for example, for a topping cycle in a power plant, in a cold burning power plant. We did the analysis, if you put the thermoelectric uh, at the high side between the steam temperature and the, sorry, between the flame temperature and the steam temperature, uh, there is a huge amount of exergy loss. And uh, there you showed that you can increase the power plant efficiencies by um, almost 7% using uh, standard materials with ZT of about 0.8 or 0.9. Um, uh, then we focused on uh, some other aspects of the system, which is beyond um, you know, simple leg geometries. What else can we do to improve the performance? One idea was to use a three-dimensional thermoelectric leg. So standard thermoelectric leg uh, is like a square, um, and um, you have the hot side and the cold side to be the same. The current flow is the same as the heat flow. If all we do is we 
take the center of it uh, on the cold side and we send current with the same material property, the maximum cooling of uh, the three-dimensional cooler is 108 degree, which is significantly more than what you can achieve in, with bismuth telluride in 1D geometry. We said that it also gives a very high power factor on the order of 600 watt per centimeter square. Um, of course, um, uh, uh, the advantage come because of the 3D heat spreading, uh, so the amount of um, uh, the, the, the geometry of the substrate uh, plays a role. Um, if you want to go beyond this, if instead of this metal right here is silicon, the cooling you can get for silicon maximum is about one, one and a half degrees. Uh, one thing we discuss is the possibility to uh, integrate a super lattice or a micro refrigerator on a chip. On top of silicon, you can grow three micron thick uh, uh, layers of silicon and silicon germanium carbon. And uh, basically by sending a current, you can make the single leg uh, micro coolers. There is a Peltier cooling in the substrate, which is, as I said, is only one degrees. By adding this tiny layer, three micron layer, can increase the cooling to about seven degrees Celsius at 100 degree ambient temperature and cooling power densities that are uh, more than 500 watt per centimeter square. Uh, one of the uh, other things one could do when you have a very tiny refrigerator is you can make a very fast cooling because the thermal mass is very small. Um, the cooling happens at the interface of uh, metal and semiconductor. If you have ground uh, signal ground, coplanar type waveguide to send electrical signal, then there is an impedance matching uh, and avoids uh, having um, electrical uh, ringing uh, in the current. And and as a, you can get cooling happen very quickly in the first 100 to 200 nanosecond, you can see a couple of degrees, one, one and a half degree cooling happening at the tiny locations. Um, that was one of the advantages. One of the things uh, is not as much emphasized in the literature is that often when you do something fancy with a super lattice, um, because of the intriguing uh, material properties, there is um, a lot of attention. If we compare a super lattice cooler that is about uh, three micron thick with an alloy of silicon germanium, the actual cooling is not that different. It's four degree here, 4.2 degree here. Um, why is it by adding all of these multi layers, we are not benefiting? Uh, uh, if you look at how the properties were measured, uh, basically we have two effects that cancel each other. Thermal conductivity of the super lattice in this particular case case with silicon germanium is actually higher than the alloy. So there is a penalty due to higher thermal conductivity. The power factor should be higher because of uh, multi-barrier electron filtering effect. The improvement is um, maybe 25% or so, but they cancel each other at the end. You get ZT values that are quite similar. Um, so that's kind of an area where the, there is room. How can we design a type of super lattice where the thermal conductivity is reduced at the same time as power factor increased. Um, there are some claims that uh, bismuth telluride um, super lattices could do that, uh, but we need uh, more independent verification. We also said, uh, basically, uh, if you do a thin film cooling, ZT that is needed to really have an impact um, is kind of on the order of 0.5 or so. So uh, the key challenge is to integrate the cooler with uh, small additional losses. This is the maximum cooling versus uh, the active layer figure of merit ZT. Today is 0.1 or 0.08. If we increase it to 0.5, by decreasing thermal conductivity, increasing CB coefficient, we can get better cooling and better cooling power density. For cooling, the trend is reverse. Basically, for cooling, increasing CBEC is better than decreasing thermal conductivity. If you remember the cost analysis for power generation, thermal conductivity decrease was better. And it makes sense because in a cooling case, um, CBEC coefficient is what gives the Peltier coefficient and the cooling power density. Uh, the end uh, numbers is that uh, if you want to locally cool a hot spot in a chip, 50 by 50 micron square area, you need something on the order of 10 micron with a ZT of 0.5, and that way you can cool a kilowatt per centimeter square hot spot by more than 15 degrees. Um, 
then we um, uh, kind of turn our attention to um, a grading of thermoelectric materials. We mentioned that often when you have a large temperature gradient between the cold and the hot side, um, you can design the thermoelectric materials at different regions uh, to have the ZT that is picked at those temperatures under operation. Um, this functional optimization to maximize local ZT is something that everybody usually assumes, uh, but what we and uh, we were uh, discussing is that that's actually not rigorously um, necessary. Uh, there is an important uh, paper about thermoelectric property of composite mediums um, and the claim that the Z effective of a composite medium is uh, cannot exceed the Z uh, value of any of the components. Um, this is correct as long as the medium is an, some sort of an average medium where there are not macroscopic locations of heating and cooling. If the medium, instead of being um, kind of a mixture of different regions, kind of randomly and so on, uh, that's where the case, uh, the analysis for Bergman and Levy was done, is that in this case, as an effective medium, you can define Z and you can get some properties. But when is uh, the thermoelectric leg is regular? Um, for example, you have a leg, one side is uh, cold, the other side is hot, and intentionally you make certain regions with higher Seebeck and certain regions with lower electrical conductivity. In this case, you actually can beat the one-half ZT uh, maximum that you can uh, achieve with each part of these legs. Um, so that was a, a kind of a significant insight uh, that the idea that local ZT doesn't need to be optimized. Here, if I have a leg and I make this side of it, I send current and uh, this side, for example, uh, cools uh, and this side heats, um, I basically break the symmetry. There is a heat sink, for example, on one side. Um, and by breaking the symmetry, now the locations where internal Peltier cooling or heating happen um, depends where they are in the leg and the joule effect is more distributed. So you can play with the distributions and actually um, win comparing to what you would get individually with each one of these uh, legs. Um, we said that uh, uh, kind of the physics of this comes, uh, what we discuss as a, um, a uniform efficiency criterion. By playing with this, we actually ensure that the efficiency of energy conversion or cooling at each location along the leg is the same. Um, we uh, then focus on another um, effect that happens in um, thin film devices uh, or uh, low temperatures is a nonlinear Peltier effect. At low dopings, the electron um, uh, electrons in the material have a low heat capacity. When they are under an applied bias, uh, they gain energy and they don't have enough time to lose it. So their average energy of moving electrons goes up with applied bias or applied current. At high doping, 10 to the 18, uh, the Peltier coefficient is independent of current. But at low dopings, it becomes a, a significant function of the current square. This nonlinearity happens at low doping, so it's a low temperature effect. That uh, it's uh, something that is not captured using the standard thermoelectric theories because electrons heat up. Um, and Monte Carlo methods have been used to verify this type of analytical approaches. And one of the things that uh, you can see is that how this can be used um, in a, a device structure. Um, so basically, uh, where it comes from is with graphs uh, such as this, that actually captures the average energy of the electrons inside the device. Here we, I have a device uh, of one micron thick barrier of low doped in gas, and then I have a highly doped uh, indium gallium arsenide on the two sides. Um, there is, I think, a energy barrier between them uh, here uh, uh, could be a, a barrier of uh, uh, indium gallium aluminum arsenide or something that adds an energy filtering. Uh, the basic idea is uh, in each layer you can define an average energy uh, for transport. That's what is the Peltier coefficient or the Seebeck coefficient. Um, electrons 
cool and heat before they enter uh, the active region. That was a major conclusion that came out uh, uh, in the, uh, from the Monte Carlo analysis. So the way to look at it is that basically you have hot and cold electrons in material at the contact. When you add the thermoelectric leg, these uh, hot electrons can move, uh, the cold ones need to evaporate, uh, so that creates the cooling in the contact. So really, even in the diffusive limit, when this leg is hundreds of microns or millimeters, still the cooling at the contact can be considered um, as an evaporative effect um, and uh, it happening in the uh, contact layer. Um, of course, it becomes to equilibrium and you can see an average uh, thermal conductivity, uh, sorry, average Seebeck coefficient in the layer. This average changes with bias and that's what happens at low temperatures and uh, low bias, uh, low dopings. Uh, we don't have to worry about the bias dependence, but the picture about the change in energy happening on the two electrodes is valid for every doping. We also showed graphs such as this. If you have a single barrier um, uh, uh, and you look at Monte Carlo simulation of 5,000 electron incident, uh, it will uh, you will see that it takes about a micron for electrons to come to equilibrium. So the uh, joule heating in the barrier is not uniform. Most of it happens near the hot side. Um, but one thing is actually a good contrast to go back and forth between this Monte Carlo simulation and this Monte Carlo simulation. Here you see that it takes about a distance of 10,000 angstrom. The voltage here is 5 kilowatt per centimeter. If I have a barrier of, let's say, 1 micron, uh, that's about uh, 0.5 volt uh, per micron. Um, uh, 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 is applied to the barriers about 500 millivolt. If you go back to this one, the voltages we apply are slightly less. It's on the order of 40 to 200 millivolt. Um, but here you don't see uh, uh, the distance over which electrons become to equilibrium and they're, they establish an average energy is much uh, shorter than this one. And the main difference between the two cases is electron-electron uh, interactions. Um, so that's something that needs to be taken into account uh, whenever you compare two different devices. Um, uh, finally, uh, one of the other thing we mentioned is um, the thermoelectric effect in uh, it's it's something that happens at the metal semiconductor junction is a unipolar um, device, but it also inside bipolar devices, even a PN junction, there could be thermoelectric heating and cooling because you have electrons that are injected and the average energy of transported electrons at different interfaces could change. And we discuss that this can give rise to internal cooling, for example, in a light emitting device. We call this electrically pumped optical refrigerator or injection current internally cooled uh, light emitter icicle. Um, so these are the intricacy of the thermoelectric effect in the bipolar material. There is a rich uh, uh, device physics which not necessarily does not give you a refrigerator with a hot and cold side but redistribute the heat inside the device and it can be used to make the, the, the important area of the device, the junction, uh, cooler. Um, let me summarize um, uh, all of the lectures in week four. We started by um, giving an overview of thermoelectric applications uh, for wasted recovery, recovery and cooling. Um, uh, we then focused on the cost. We said, uh, we showed that the, the cost of the thermoelectric material at today's cost on the order of $500 per kilogram could be a significant part of the energy conversion. The costs of the energy conversion with today's materials on the order of one or two dollars per watt. But one could reduce it to 10, 20 cents per watt. Uh, this uh, happens with the use of fractional area coverage, heat concentration inside the model. Uh, then we also discuss the topping cycle application where the large ZTs are not needed and they could improve the power plant efficiency significantly because they work at high temperatures. We then focused on micro refrigerators. Uh, we showed that silicon germanium already has a cooling on the order of 7 degrees C. Um, and fully integrated coolers with even a ZT of 0.5 can be quite effective to remove kilowatt per centimeter square hot spots uh, with a cooling more than 15 degrees Celsius. Um, then we discuss some of the 
effect that happens uh, using material grading uh, as well as geometry of the Peltier coolers. Interestingly, the grading and geometry helps the cooling in uh, Peltier devices. Similar type of ideas, how they can help power generation have not been put forward. Uh, it turns out um, that um, uh, the energy balance um, in the case of power generation uh, make it hard to benefit from the same type of grading that improve the cooling power density here or the device geometry. But that's an open question uh, that need to be looked at. And finally, uh, we finish the week by looking at nonlinear as well as bipolar PLT effects um, and uh, describing describing um, what are the internal cooling of in electronic and optoelectronic devices. What we will do next week, uh, we will focus on some of the physics of the um, uh, thermoelectrics, how uh, nanostructuring have affected today's material. You learn some of the fundamental ideas about uh, electron transport affected by barriers and by uh, nanostructuring uh, uh, in lectures by Professor Data and Lundstrom. Next week, we will look at some real uh, material data. We will also do some simulations of uh, realistic thermoelectric materials and how they are used and how they are optimized um, and uh, describe some of the novel uh, thermoelectric effects. I look forward to see you in week five.